Welcome to my messy life. Take my hand and dive right on in with me. It's gonna be all right. Messy and perfect life with Lee. Hi. Um. Today, my guest canceled right before, not right before, actually last night. And then I reached out to Andy Dick and he said, yes, I'll do it. And then he said, I can't make it, but he's going to come on another time, which brings me great joy because I, I adore him. Um, but what I do now is instead of going, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I take it as a sign. It's time for me to do one by myself. And I love that choice because it's not stressing out. I'm not going crazy trying to fill the space. I'm just going with the flow with what is and knowing that I have plenty of to talk about without having another human body next to me. So I'm so glad you're here with me today. And I want to start this like I do most things, but I don't do it when a guest is here and I'm not sure why. I just jump right into talking, but I love to start everything with three grounding breaths. Um, normally I have my feet on the floor touching whatever ground I'm on, but because I have my dog propped so comfortably on my lap, I don't want to bother him. Yeah, I'm going to bother him. He'll be okay. All right. I'll put you back in a second, Coco. So if you want to put your feet on the ground to join me um, in three grounding breaths and use this time to quiet your mind, to come into the present moment, to let go of all of the things that are on your to-do list or heavy on your heart to just show up during this time with me, uh, just for yourself. So we're going to close our eyes, breathe in through our nose, hold for two and out through our mouth. And then we'll do it again um, two more times. Okay. So if you join me, you can put your palms up to receive or down on your lap, lap to ground. I'm going to put mine on Coco because I've disrupted his sleep. Okay. So we'll breathe in through our nose. Hold for two and out through our mouth. <sighs> Again, in through our nose. Hold for two. And out through our mouth. In through our nose. Hold for two. And out through our mouth. Usually the first breath I just use to calm down. And the next breath I use to quiet my mind. And the third I welcome God into whatever I'm doing so that it flows way better than I ever imagined. Um, today we're talking about surrender. And even saying the word surrender makes me just like drop my shoulders and relax. It's, it's like forgiveness. It's like when you're mad at someone and you're holding a hot coal because you're so mad at what they've done, but you're the only one getting burned. So I just love that surrender means letting it go, being at peace with what is, not fighting what comes up in front of you. Um, I wrote this piece that I want to read to you. And then we'll get into some storytelling and some tools, if you will. Um, okay, I got to crisscross back up with my dog here. Get him back into the comfy position. Okay. Um, so I'm starting out this piece I wrote when I was getting my master's in spiritual psychology. I read it to a classmate as I, as an exercise to hear our words out loud before the assignment was completed. After I finished reading my piece, the classmate said, wow, I will never think about life the same again. My ego was like, wow, wow, that was good. I was excited that she thought it was so good. And then the teachers announced that they were going to have a small group of students chosen to share their work on stage. And I pretty much knew I would be one of them after this girl's reaction. When they read the selected students out on stage, I was not one of them. My ego was pissed. After about two hours of calming it down, I realized that not everyone in the big group needed to hear it that day, that only that one person who heard it was supposed to. But since I didn't get picked that day, today I'm picking myself and sharing it with all of you. I just got over something funky, so forgive my voice, please, or enjoy it, because I think it's kind of sexy like Demi Moore. Um, I would ask you to open your mind and heart. 
allowing yourself to entertain a new perspective. It is common for us to try and avoid the challenges of life and the people who challenge us. However, when we embrace them, we can learn what they came to teach and in some cases release them from that teaching role. The piece I'm about to read is a conversation between me and God before I came down here to experience humanity. Here we go. Hello, God, divine being number 33751272 here. I heard you wanted to see me. What? It's my time to go experience being human? I get to go to Earth? Awesome. I'm ready. What Earth suit am I going to get? Lee? In Kansas? Now, is Lee a boy or a girl? Oh, it's a girl? Okay, okay. But Kansas? Oh, she doesn't stay long. Okay, okay. Now, where is she? I'm ready to see her. Looking down through the clouds, God and the divine being, number 33 for short, look through the clouds and see Lee. Oh, there she is. Oh, she's so cute. Wait, her mother is not touching her. She's completely neglecting her. Oh, my. Her dad's spanking her little seven-year-old tish too hard. He's taking his rage out on her. Oh, God. She's so sad. She feels all alone. Okay, okay. Wait a second. Let me guess. Her earth school curriculum. Let me get, give me a minute. Is her story to overcome unworthiness? Yes, I'm right. I knew I would get my, my, my assignment on the first guess. Now, God, I don't mean to judge your work, but why do so many people get assigned overcoming unworthiness? I mean, couldn't you get a bit more original? I don't get it. It's like everyone, okay, 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 I'll focus. There she is in second grade. She's fist fighting with Greg Hyde and David Bishop. God, do something. Oh, she beat them both up. She's pretty tough. Now she's in fourth grade now. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, she was crowned Miss Junior Overland Park at her local mall. She was crowned the queen of the mall that she calls her second home. She's taking risks and being rewarded. God, good for her. She's in the sixth grade now. She's becoming the first girl president at John Deemer Elementary School. She's learning to overcome her obstacles. Junior high school, cheerleading, drill team, volleyball, high school, cheerleading, drill team. Wow, she's a good dancer, God. She's really using the creative talents that you've given her. All right, she's at the end of her high school year, 18 years old. She loses her virginity to Bruce Otout because she thought that was the guy she was going to marry. Oh my gosh, now she's in college. It's girls gone wild, drinking, sex, eating too much pizza. God, she's running too fast. She, doesn't she know she's better than that? Oh, wait a second. She's living her story of being unworthy. Now, in that case, she's doing a damn good job. But please tell me she figures this out soon, God, because this is hard to watch. She graduates from college with a degree in recreation and leisure. All right. That gives her dad a big belly laugh. Now she's off. St. Thomas, Virgin Islands, Guam. And she becomes a scuba diver instructor for Club Med. Oh, my gosh. I'm going to have a blast down there. She settles down in Los Angeles. Wouldn't you know that? She ends up in the City of Angels. She's still partying hard and making out. Oh, look, God, she's now 31. She's worn out and sick of being single. She's coming to you for help. <gasps> she's on her knees and being so specific with the details of her prayer. I know how helpful that is for you, God, and the angels to meet the request. Now, boy, do you reward her. She gets David Keckner. You must really like this girl to give her Dave. He's one of the brightest souls around. All right, she's starting to heal in the safe space they have created. She's doing her work, going to therapy, breaking her childhood armor around her heart. Oh my gosh, she almost dies having her first kid and loses her uterus. But God, she wanted a big family. She's so sad. But knowing you, I bet it turns out even, I bet it turns out great, doesn't it, God? Oh, really? Better than she ever imagined? She has four more kids with the help of two gestational surrogates. Now, that's not at all how this Kansas girl planned on having a family. Boy, you work in miraculous ways. Wait, I'm going to be a mom to five kids. Holy cow. Thank God that she, thank you, God, actually, sorry. 
that she's healing. So she doesn't have to continue the cycle that was passed down from her mother and her mother before. Now, she seems a bit disconnected with her kids, God. Oh, but she's working on it and learning. She's taking responsibility for her actions. She's starting authentic dialogue with her husband and children. Oh, look at that. She's sharing what she's learning with people and it's helping them. Good for her. That's what humans are called to do. People are called to connect. Oops. People are called to share their messy stuff to help other people. She's using that feeling from her childhood of being all alone to teach adults you're never alone. Oh, gosh, this is beautiful. This is what you want. She's reframing her issues as blessings. Oh, no way. Of course, she enrolled at the University of Santa Monica, God, your spirit school. Her husband's career is thriving. Lee's expanding her career, enjoying her speaking engagements and hosting a kick-ass, messy and perfect life podcast right here, people. Her light is bubbling through her and sparkling on the paths of others. What? What, God? It's time for me to go to earth right now? Wait, what else happens? Is there more good or bad coming? Oh, yeah, it all happens for our good. Everything, right? Because it's for our learning and growing. Of course. All right. Wait a second. My favorite souls are going down with me, playing my roles of my mom, my husband, my sister, and my kids. This is awesome. But there's still so, so much more I want to see. Don't I get to see any more right now? Oh, I'll be back up here in 88 years with the snap of your finger. Yeah, that is that is quick. All right. So this is the part everyone told me I'm going to freak out about. What is it? What could it be? Let me get this straight. When I go down there, I won't remember this discussion or anything about all of us being up here together. I won't know my favorite souls are coming down with me. This is an outrage, God. How can you leave me? That's not fair. Oh, right. I'm going to go down to experience humanity and you'll be with me the whole time. I wonder how long it's going to take me until I remember. Seriously, go there, though, God. There are so many people un- overcoming unworthiness. You have to get more original. Okay, okay, it's my time. Okay, I'm going. Okay. God, no, you guys, stop rushing me. Don't push me. I'm, I'm going. And then on three, one, two, three, the divine being number 33 jumps out from the heavens yelling, here I come world. We see baby Lee being held up in the air, slowly blinking her eyes for the first time as she assesses her new surroundings. And as she takes in and out her first breath, we hear the welcoming sounds of joyful cry of a newborn. (laughs) The room cheers, and so it is. Lee's life begins. And I would like to thank all of the people who have come down here to push my buttons and to show me where the work is that I still need to do, especially my family. Yay! So that is the piece I wrote for school that I didn't get to do on stage. And it so beautifully illustrates what I think is going on here on the planet is that we come these beautiful bright lights, we come these beautiful stars temporarily housed in these earth suits. And mine, of course, gets more stretchy every day. Thank you, body, for reminding me I'm on the second half, the second chapter of my story. Um, But we come down here as these beautiful bright lights and our lights get covered as they're supposed to be because we are um, raised by humans, people who are missing the mark people who are still working through their own stuff. So our bright light gets covered. All of a sudden we become adults and we think, who the hell am I and why am I here? And it's our job as adults. And even if you're hearing this and you're younger, to start now peeling off the layers that covered our bright light, start letting it shine and start stepping into um, the whole reason that we are here on the planet, which is your soul's journey. It's your specific journey, not anyone else's, not your children, your parents, your siblings, your friends. It's you're here for you. Um, and the the subject we're talking about today is surrender. And I love it so much because when you have the perspective, I just told you that good stuff's coming, the things that we label good and bad, it's all coming and it's all for our learning. And when you really start to let that sink into your being, into your heart, into your knowing, then you can start flowing with life. 
then you can start riding the waves and not being always knocked off and crippled by them, knowing disease might be coming to you or someone that you know, knowing death is inevitable from your pets to your loved ones to yourself, all of it's coming. So we can quit constantly being knocked off our rocker going, I can't believe this is happening to me. Of course, this is happening to me. Of course, this isn't happening to me. Of course, this is happening for me. This is happening for my evolution, my heart opening, and for me to stand stronger in my knowing of who I am. When we constantly get knocked over and go, I can't believe this happened again, and we stay in victim mode, man, you're going to die in victim mode. You will never soar to why God put you on this planet. And FYI, you are so special that there is not one person on this planet who has the same nose as you. Out of seven billion people, no one is as special and exact as you are. No one sees life the way that you see it. No one can tell the stories that only you can tell. That's how there can be so many great poets and artists and speakers and writers. And knowing that whatever you do, you come into, you bring all of you, whether you're teaching, mentoring, taking care of babies or plants, whatever it is. So allow yourself to know your greatness and allow yourself to know that obstacles are coming and kick ass, welcome them, embrace them, work through them, get messy in them and stand stronger and share what you've learned after. Um, Surrender for me, my greatest moments of surrender have been on my knees. And um, back in the day on my knees meant something entirely different before I knew who I was. And I was trying so hard to connect with people and to make others feel good and myself. So I like that being on my knees has shifted quite a bit for me, that now it's a place of um, such heavy heartache, such heavy um, bone crushing uh, things that come up, obstacles that I try so hard to plow through or fight or wonder why or cling to that I get so worn out. I get so worn out for trying so hard that I finally just get on my knees and say, God, I can't do this anymore alone. I need your help. And the times that I've done that, miraculous things have come from it. And I want to share a few of them with you. Um, it's like even even when I had my first kid and I almost died and they took out my uterus and I mourned all the kids I, I would never have. And, and I, then I let go of the idea of how I thought I was supposed to have a family. And we started to move forward in whatever way. And we were looking into adoption. And as I was moving forward, more doors were opening. And my doctor said, we left your ovaries. You can still make embryos and incubate them in somebody else's body. So as I got up from, I cried. I went six months of therapy after I lost my uterus. I did the work. I didn't just blow it off and walk away. I, I did the work. I got in the mess. I felt what it brought up for me. Um, And then I surrendered it and started moving forward. And I think that's in the power is the surrender, knowing something greater than we could ever imagine is coming and then moving forward without caring what the hell it is. That's surrender. So with my whole experience with having kids, I was like, all right, I got through the heartache of it. I worked through it. I learned from it. And now I'm ready to move forward going to adopt. And then this other way came, we went with the other way. And then the things that came from that, I was in constant surrender because it's pretty amazing when you have a baby and you adopt, you're in gratitude of getting this baby, right? But when you create your own baby and you stick it in someone else's body and they leave and you don't see them, you're at the mercy of another human being that you don't know that well. And uh, my first real huge surrender besides actually my, my first surrender was getting on my knees when I met my husband, David, because I was so worn out and I had been on my knees for a long time doing other things. And I had low self-esteem and I kept trying and trying and I was so tired, but I knew I was so ready to welcome my partner. And that was the first time I hit my knees. And I said, God help me. I've been trying on my own to do this. I'm not doing it so well. I know exactly what I want. And I said, tall, funny, kind hearted, smarter than me. And I, I knew these things. And I said, I don't know how to get there, God. Take this from me. I, I need you. And then I stood up 
brushed my hands off, walked away and totally released it almost so much so that I forgot that I had said the prayer. And three weeks later, when I met my husband in the airport terminal and I looked in his eyeballs, I knew this is exactly what I had asked for. And so I, I surrendered on my knees from a place of heartache and heartbreak and tiredness. But in that space, I'm completely open to receive something new, something fresh. And I'm no longer attached to me trying to be a part of it. I can just surrender it to the higher power, to God, to the golden link that links all of us together, making us all connected. I surrender to that big ass, beautiful force. And I can let it go knowing it's coming, not when or how or what it's going to look like, but knowing it's coming. So when I saw David, I received him. I got him. Been married for, for a while, 21 some odd years, I think. 21. Anyway, um, that was my first on my knees story. And the next one was when we got pregnant with the first surrogate with Margot. Uh, I picked a gal. We went to kind of a, a little bit of a lower end agency, which means it didn't cost as much and you didn't get as much handholding or liaisons to help with everything. Um, but at the time, we didn't have a lot of money and that was what we could afford. And the process was so dang expensive on itself. So I got a surrogate. She had four kids. She seemed nice. She brought me like a box of clothes because she worked for Chimbury and I was going to get free clothes for my baby and things couldn't be better and blah, blah, blah. And I thought, I'm going to be your best friend. And I was all in. And then we got pregnant. And I was like, oh my gosh, we got pregnant our first try. Three fresh embryos. The first time we put them in and we got pregnant with a little girl. And pretty much right, you know, I had bled out. And, and so anything with bleeding and pregnancy freaks me out. And I remember right after pregnancy, she said, I'm bleeding. And I panicked because I knew that that meant she was losing the baby. And I knew for me that meant almost death and not being able to have kids. So I kind of was like freaking out. Then after that, she told me that she went camping and got third degree burns and was dehydrated. Then after that, she told me that she was painting her house and felt faint, but you're not supposed to paint. Then she told me she fell off a ladder, but you're not supposed to be on a ladder when you're pregnant. And then these things kept happening, you guys. And I was like, crying and couldn't eat and I was getting thin and I was freaking out and I was like this oh my god and googling everything and saying you're not supposed to do that why are you on a ladder I mean this love for this child that I didn't even have or even have control over was in somebody else's body who's telling me all this bad stuff and she's like oh I drank a couple Dr. Peppers today I was like it was in our contract you're not supposed to drink soda it's like all of these things that we agreed to all of these things that I read in the book you're not supposed to do they were all happening and I couldn't do a damn thing about it. And the agency was like, I'll talk to her. But it was just this crazy thing. And I remember that she told me, oh, no. She, kept, she told me like one other thing. I mean, it was something as outrageous as I got trampled by 50, 250 pound uh, football players and my belly got flattened. It was something so bad that I literally dropped on my knees. And I closed my eyes in tears and I said, God, I can't take this anymore. Help me. I'm get, like, I can't eat. I'm worried all the time. I, I can't really take care of Charlie because I'm so focused on and I mean, I was just on my knees broken with the worry and the stress and the fighting. And I quieted my mind and I said my prayer and I took some breaths and I heard clear as day. I don't know if it was in my head or out of my head, but I heard clear as day. My hands were holding your baby when she was created. My hands were there putting the baby into the surrogate's uterus. And my hands will deliver you this perfect, beautiful, healthy baby. And in that moment, a peace came over me like the most soothing, warm water in a shower or the most soft, warmed up blanket you could ever put. I felt so held and so protected and so at peace that when she called me a week later and said she was in a really bad car accident and was taken away via ambulance, I said, boy, that must have been scary for you. I'll see you on Tuesday. And then I called the ambulance company in her area. I called the two hospitals. She was not admitted. I called the ambulance company that was not associate with the hospital. They never picked up a girl with that name. And I realized 
something's going on here. My baby's okay. God gave me peace. I'm going to get that child and this relationship's over. It was a profession. At that point, I went from we're going to be best friends to this is it. Like I'm learning some big ass lessons here. Uh, I'm going to take my baby, pay her what we agreed to and call it a day. But I'll never forget at the heaviness and heartache and stress of what I felt of being out of control with my own child and thinking she was being injured or harmed or, or killed or whatever was happening to release that and to be blessed with this grace and this peace that's available to us that I'm learning when I'm on my knees. So anyway, Margo was born healthy. She came home. Second she came out, I could see that it was my baby. She looked just like Charlie, and my husband. And um, um, I was able to receive that child to say thank you to the surrogate and to move forward with new knowledge and power uh, that, that God does have my back. And that when I remember to go and to connect and to have a complete open heart, I'm supported. And surrender is the biggest gift and way to receive it, especially for your first time, the grace that's available to us. Um, I, I had another one with my son, Charlie. I think I've spoken it on here before, but he was born like a complicated ass mofo. There was stuff going on from the very beginning and I noticed it all. I was like, wow, he's touching everything all the time. Wow, he's following his friends in preschool and doing exactly what they do. Wow. And I would say, does Charlie have OCD? Does Charlie have blah, blah, blah? Because I'm noticing these things. They're all like, no, he's totally fine here. He's great. We don't notice anything. I was like, all right. Kept going on. But things were getting more and more kind of harsh and severe as time went on. And we were going to more and more doctors and trying more and more medicines. And I was literally like, Charlie was like a full-time job for me. Every minute was figuring how I can help him navigate himself, how I can help him get in the right school to support him, how I can help him find the right friends and play dates, how this therapy, this medicine, this doctor, I mean, it was hardcore for 13 years. I felt like at the end I was carrying a 13 year old child, boy, man, child, baby on a platter and I couldn't carry it anymore and I couldn't do anything else. And I was like, oh, I can't breathe. And I remember he was getting when he was, you know, getting into his teen years, I could still put him in kind of like a wraparound hold. So when he got really out of control or really like he wanted to break something or hit someone or, you know, I could get him in a a hold to hold him so he couldn't do it. And then he got too big. And I remember he kicked a hole in the wall over something and I had the guy come and patch it and sand it. And, and he came back to paint it. And the day that he painted it, Charlie came home from school. And this, about a year before this happened, my therapist said, you need to send Charlie to a therapeutic boarding school. And I said, fuck you, do your job. I'm paying you money, a lot of money. Do your job. Don't just send us away. And I I was holding onto this. I'm going to help him. And then uh, he kicked a hole. The guy came, painted it, which was the third step of repairing it. Charlie came home that day from school and said, can I have a a Slurpee from 7-Eleven? And I said, no. And he kicked a hole in the same spot I just had painted. And my husband was traveling all the time. I had, at that time, three other kids, his younger sister and twins. I had twins at this point. And I couldn't even look at them because I was, all of my heaviness, all of all of me was going to helping Charlie navigate being Charlie. So it came time when he kicked the hole in the wall. I fell to the ground bawling. He sat down next to me bawling and said, I don't know why I'm doing this, Mom. I'm so sorry. I don't want to do this. And I said, I'm so sorry but I'm not enough for you. I'm not 24 hours support. I don't know how to doctor you. I don't know how I I can just be your mom and I'm not enough. So we ended up sending him to a therapeutic boarding school. And I remember coming back from that. He was 13 years old, probably going to be there for two years. And I remember coming back and being in a ball in my bed and so depressed and having this thought, you're not even good enough for your own kid. You can't even take care of your own kid. And then I started coming out of that, slowing my mind. And, and, um, I feel like my point of surrender in that was getting on my knees or actually on my butt next to Charlie and crying and realizing I couldn't do it anymore. Realizing this was bigger than me. And, um, I did go to God for that, for help. I just said, help me here because I'm broken. And we found the perfect school for him to go to in Boise, Idaho, this great, great 
therapeutic boarding school and it was on beautiful acres and I came home and beat myself up and cried. And then I stood up and said, enough of this bullshit, stand up. Look at your other four beautiful kids that are in front of you that you have not given enough attention to because you've been focusing on Charlie. And a lot of people recognize this when they, you focus on a sick kid for whatever reason, if they have, you know, even the flu, you can't focus on your other kids because you're so worried. But if they have a disease or they have cancer, if they have anything going on with them, all your focus is because your heart wants to help, but the other kids get neglected. So I was able to stand up, take off the wet blanket, look into their eyes and say, hi, I'm your mom, because I really don't feel like I got to show up fully because I've been so preoccupied here. So I got to show up for them, which was beautiful. I got to start standing up in, in joy and happiness because my first kid was kind of so, such a heavy ride that I was in that ride with these kids too. So I got to see them in a new way. I got to show up in a new way. And they did these long once a month therapeutic weekends at, the kid, at Charlie's school. So I'd go from a Thursday to Sunday and it was all about parenting stuff and new ways of looking at things and activities with Charlie and new ways to honor who he was exactly where he was without having to change him. So at the end of the two years, Charlie came home. I learned all of the lessons that he came to teach me because uh, I'm a huge believer that kids or everyone in life are our spiritual teachers. But for me, the most are my family members because uh, it's so intimate. Charlie came to teach me to back the fuck off, to take a breath, to see who another individual is and to honor all of that individual, not try to make them fit into being the football player, the soccer player, going to camps, doing all these things when that's not their jam, to see who they are and honor who they are and fit things around where they are instead of shoving them constantly into places to try and fix them, make them better, make them be what you think a son is supposed to be. So Charlie, besides my mother and my husband, has been my greatest spiritual teacher. And the magical thing about when you surrender and you start to flow with what is instead of fighting it, and trust you guys, I fought for 13 years what was, which is that I have a really kind-hearted, cool, quirky, really cool kid with a deep knowing of suffering and a deep knowing and a deep empathy for other humans. And I know that God has done all this in his life to prepare him to help people in whatever capacity. Right now he's looking at being an actor, but he'll use his, his heartache and his stress and all that he knows for acting and it will catapult him. So um, anyway, I do believe this. When you learn the lesson from the person that's showing up to teach you, they can take on a new role. They no longer have to play that part. So with Charlie, he got to come home a different person and he's a different person. That is not the same boy that came here that I struggled with. Why? I think not only because he matured and his frontal cortex, you know, closed and all of the kind of stuff that you need to navigate life um, when you're struggling, but also because I got the lessons he came to teach me. So he got to drop that story and move forward in a new chapter of his life. Uh, surrender is freaking powerful. It's one of the most beautiful gifts we can give ourselves as is forgiveness. And when you start to surrender, you can start to accept and be at peace with what is and learn from the heartache as opposed to staying in it and being a victim. My mother, if she would have done that, if my son wouldn't have put me through such a hard time, we can start learning and being in gratitude for it. It's freaking amazing. Surrender is the most beautiful flow of love uh, and healing and understanding and learning and light and power. It's amazing. So I'm happy we're talking about surrender today, people. Um, you know, another one, a big surrender story was my daughter Eve. We got pregnant with her last one. She was frozen 10 years, thawed out the last four embryos. One survived, put her into the same girl named Tara who had my twins. And we got pregnant with Eve. I was like, holy Toledo, man. It was so specific to me as I got in the journey of surrogacy that Dave kept worrying because we had 11 embryos that we were going to have 11 kids. And I said, no, man, this is already past us. This is already stuff that has nothing to do with our thoughts. We are in the flow of what's supposed to be. We got the specific amount of embryos. 
And there are specific children who are supposed to come into our life for teaching and for growing, for healing, to be our family. It's specific and it's out of our control. So if none of the things work, a lot of times in vitro doesn't work. You know, you're bringing in another person's body as well. Like a lot of times it doesn't work. But I had no concern about that. I had no concern if we're going to get too much or too many, if we're going to get too few, if we weren't going to get pregnant. I had no concern about it because I knew I was in some flow already and I was surrendered to what was coming. I had no fear. Um, until Eve. Um, no, so after we got pregnant with Eve, the doctor said something's wrong with your baby. I'm not going to go too detailed in it. But they said something's wrong. You need to go to this doctor. Yeah, something's wrong. You need to go to this doctor. Yeah, something's wrong. You need to go to the neonatal specialist in the country. And I went to her and she said, your daughter's brain stopped growing. She won't even have the mentality of a one day old. Her bones aren't on the charts. Everything from head to toe is neurologically wrong with her. I would suggest termination. I only had the baby because I couldn't throw away embryo. Now they're telling me to terminate that that was the most gracious thing. So anyway, it was kind of this whole thing we went through with Eve and I remember getting on my knees and saying, God, I don't know what to do here. Um, I'm just put in this position and da, 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 and I don't want to terminate. We decided not to terminate, even though I learned it was a beautiful, viable option, which changed my perspective of judging anyone for anything. But we didn't terminate. But I did get on my knees and surrender it to God. And I said, take this. You I know from Margo, you put this baby in the uterus. You, your hand is in all of this. I surrender to you. Let me remove my bullshit thoughts. Let me re remove the things I'm spinning and, and actually suffering over. I was creating my own suffering. Our thoughts create suffering. When you surrender, you're no longer holding yourself captive. You're no longer beating yourself up. So I surrender this shit. I surrendered it to God. And I stood up and I said, whatever comes, no, they told me, oh, after I surrendered, this is a crazy part. After I surrendered, after I learned to have judgment on no one for anything, every time I have judgment, by the way, God brings it to me firsthand to experience what it's like for the people who have experienced it. And then my judgment melts away. So I'm trying to be as I'm trying to be non-judgmental over everyone, whatever the hell they do, knowing that it's on their path, what they're supposed to be doing. The second I freaking judge someone, God brings it and drops it in my lap. And then I have to deal with it, feel it, know it, so I can release it and accept the, the, whoever I was judging. So just a little hint, try not to judge, motherfuckers, because um, it'll be brought back to you for your learning. A lot of times people who are super homophobic get a gay child. A lot of times people who say, it's this way, get something to show them the other way. So just know it's all gifts, but you can save yourself suffering by surrendering to what is, accepting it, being in gratitude for the obstacles and the pain. Um, but what I was going to say about Evie is the minute I surrendered to God, I let go of what I thought this baby should look like or how she should walk or where she should sit or her wheelchair or the therapy or all the stuff that was coming. As soon as I surrendered that, we went back for an appointment. The doctor said, this is a woman who didn't like to speak. She kept her mouth shut. She didn't want me to talk. She really examines for 20 minutes. And then she'll turn and give me what's going on. So she starts looking and out of her pie hole comes, oh my God. Now, mind you, Eve had eight markers of a neurological disorder. If you have two, there's some pretty big concern. Eve had one arm that was twisted up behind her back like that. I can't even do it. But um, I thought, what could be, oh my Godding? Because they've already told me to terminate. We already know everything's wrong with her. Did her arm fall off? That weird twisted arm in the back. So I just said, oh my God, what? Did her arm fall off? And the doctor goes, no, there's been a miraculous turnaround. Now I already had my armor. I had my specialist. I had the wheelchair picked out. I already knew what was coming. I, I had my armor to prepare myself to, to, to handle this. So when she said there's been a miraculous turnaround, it was like a ting that bounced off my armor. I didn't even hear it. And I said to her, miraculous, what does that mean? Like a miracle? And she goes, uh, there's been just a really big turnaround. So I remember going home. We went back for an appointment. They said her bones are now measuring on the charts. Her brain's at 20%. Her echogenic bowels cleared. Her fingers and toes are now, they're not like this. They're in a uh, normal, normal prenatal position. She goes, if I didn't know any better, I'd, I would tell you you're going to have a healthy baby girl. 
And she goes, the only case I could find was 50 years ago. Somebody had this infectious disease and it mimicked a neurological disorder. Then they got better and it caught up, but that baby was born blind. And I said, no, you said it was a miracle. My baby's completely healthy and I accept that and she will not be born blind. And then I said a quiet prayer, God, if you let her be born healthy, I will proclaim her a modern day miracle. So Eve was born healthy. She came out. I was like, oh my God, she's a modern day miracle. Then we went to church and they said, we'd like to welcome Eve to the congregation. I was like, could I say something, pastor? And I stood up and I said, this is Eve and she's a modern day miracle. And my minister was like, what the hell was that? And I was like, I I don't know. I didn't know it was going to come out like Moses, but literally I proclaimed her for a year out loud. This is Eve. She's a modern day miracle. Damn it. And then the second year, I was like, this is Eve. She's a modern day miracle. And then the third year, I was like, this is Eve in my head. And I'd be like, God, did we put a time limit on this? How long do I have to say this? But anyway, I've stopped until now. She is a modern day miracle. The moment I surrendered to what was, the moment I accepted Eve for all of who she was, she got to change. Now, people can say that's bullshit or that's not what happened. And it was this or that, whatever. I don't care what I know is that the moment I got her lesson that she came to teach me was full acceptance and no judgment on anyone for anything. Eve got to change her story. Eve got to become something different and move on to her next teaching for me, which is constant, man. That one is a live wire. Um, so once again, I gave up on my knees. I surrendered. God took me. I went in the flow with what was, at peace with what was, and it got to transform into something uh, greater than I ever imagined. Um, so think about you guys, think about right now, what, uh, you're struggling with, what your obstacles feel like, what's the story you've been telling yourself over and over. What is it? Is it, I, I'm not good enough, or I can't get a better job, or I can't find a husband, or I can't, because guess what? Whether you think you can or can't, you're right. I think that was Henry Ford. Um, if you are playing the same loop, if you're doing the same damn thing, and that's Einstein said, Uh, The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and hoping for a different result. So think about what feels hard. Think about what you're swimming up current. What are you carrying on your bag walking up the hill? If hard is in your vocabulary, you're out of line with what you're to be doing. That's the universe saying, hey, buddy, I'm going to put on more weights till you slow down. And if you don't, you're going to drop to your knees and then we can get to work. So I'm trying to help myself and you remember, we don't have to always get to the point of brokenness. We don't always have to drop to our knees, although that is the most beautiful place to welcome in uh, God's grace and surrender. It's the most beautiful place and the most vulnerable and open place to do it. Um, But we can get there now faster and faster. When I get kicked in the stomach, when I get badass news, when I found a lump in my throat, recently, and I'd had a really bad year last year and very much stress. And I know when you hold stress, it causes dis-ease in your body. And when you're in dis-ease, it becomes disease. So I had realized that I'd done that to my body and wore myself out last year. And this year I was like, I'm not doing that anymore. Oh shit. I found a lump in my throat. And one of my dearest friends, Bill Ferguson died, uh, uh, I think from throat cancer in December. And I watched that and I thought, oh my gosh, my throat looks like his throat. So I had all these crazy thoughts in my head. So I went immediately to the doctor. She was like, no, it's swollen, but you're fine. But I didn't believe her and I made her take a blood test. And then I went to see a ear, nose and throat specialist. Oh, I got a sonogram and they found like a a node on my whatever thing that does with your weight or whatever. I can't remember. Ben, do you know what that is? They found a nodule on my thing where you hypothyroid. Thyroid. Thank you, thyroid. Thank you. Yeah. So they found a nodule, a note on my thyroid, but they said it's nothing, not nothing to worry about. And that's nowhere near the lump I found up here. So I went to an ear, nose, and throat doctor. He looked down and said, It's beautiful in there. It's crystal clear. There's not a damn thing wrong with you. But I had to go through those steps to free myself of the story that I got myself into disease. But what I did do when I found that bump was, all right, I'm going to go get it checked out and I'm going to take care of it but I'm going to surrender to it. I'm going to welcome this thing. I'm going to let it teach me. I'm going to learn everything it's shown up to teach me so I can let it go forever. And that's kind of where I'm getting closer and closer with the things that are scary, that are hard. 
welcome them, look at them, say, what are you here to teach me? And then flow with it. It's like if I, if I ever got cancer or I meet someone who's at the beginning stages of finding out, I will say, welcome the cancer, welcome the medicine, welcome the learnings, welcome all of it to heal it, to let it go. I'm going to fight cancer with love or I'm going to love my cancer away because I don't even like the idea of fighting because that's resistance. I think fighting is, is getting in, doing the work, getting messy and flowing with what is and accepting it and surrendering. Oh, it feels so good to surrender, you guys, especially if you have something heavy right now, man. Think about it. Think about why it's showing up. Think about why it's showing up again. Get it. Learn from it. Embrace it. Get in the mess of it. Feel it. Sit in it. And then stand up and walk through it. Uh, you'll be more powerful. You'll be out of victim mode. And it can never come back again if you get it. Um, I have one that was uh, more recent as well. Is is my 50th birthday party. I've talked about this a little bit. But I just love the example of it. Uh, turning 50, planning a big ass party in Mexico. And my friend helped me plan it. And she picked the date because she wasn't available on my actual birthday. So I booked that date. And and got a little group of people together. And then the girl that helped me plan it, who helped me pick the date, fell out, said I can't come. I was like, all right. And then someone else said they couldn't come. And then my husband said I can't come. And then I'm going to freaking Mexico for my 50th birthday by myself. And I sat down in my chair. And in the past, I would have wept. And I would have said, I'm too much for everyone. I don't have any friends. I'm alone. I da da da. All the stories I used to tell myself, they started to try and creep up. And then I said, oh, hell no. Thank you for showing up stories so I can remember that this is for a reason, but I'm not going to go down pity party. I'm not going to go down victim mode. I immediately opened up to God and I said, okay, God, obviously those weren't the people I was supposed to be surrounded by for my 50th birthday in Mexico. I welcome the angels you have coming. Literally, I said that. I think two hours later, this girl that I went to college with, Lynn, called me and goes, hey, I was just thinking about you, blah, 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 blah. I said, hey, you want to go to Mexico for my 50th? She goes, yes. And she booked her ticket. Then I went up to this friend that I just met who's been on my podcast, Jill. And I said, hey, you want to come to my 50th birthday party in Mexico? She goes, yes. Can I bring my husband? I go, yes. And then a girl reached out to me that I met once five years before and goes, I'm coming to LA. I'd love to see you. I go, well, you want to go to my birthday party? She goes, yes. And her and her husband flew out. The most eclectic group of people came together in a week that I hadn't even thought of to bring. And we went to Mexico and it was the perfect group of people to see each other, to compliment each other, to support each other. And I remember on my birthday, we had glasses of Vouve, my favorite champagne, if I'm not super loaded, which would probably be Dom Perignon, if I'm saying that correct, or Cristal, but I love Vouve. We all had Vouve, the sun was setting, we all had tans, everyone was kind of glowing. And I looked at these women in the sunlight and I, my eyes just filled with tears because my heart was overflowing at how gracious God is and how much God does have my back and how much when I surrender, he paints a picture I never imagined could be so beautiful. And the women there, I told him, you guys are angels. I prayed for you guys and you showed up one by one. And that group became a little group and we still do stuff together and people, no one knew each other that came together in that night, that, that week, that weekend or week or however long the hell we were there, I think a week, no one knew each other, but they're all friends now, separate of me traveling, doing things together. It was so beautiful to watch the magic that can happen when we surrender, trust God and get the hell out of our own way. Um, so that's kind of it. That's what I wanted to talk about today is the, the surrender is such a kind gift. It's such a softening of the heart. It's such a deep step in faith, in love, and knowing without knowing a gosh damn thing. I want to say God damn thing, but I don't like to use the Lord's name while I'm talking so highly of him, her, she, it. Um, but really just allowing yourself to shut your crazy ass mind, get on your knees, 
and to take it out of your body and hand it to an energy that we can't even comprehend that's available, that has our back, that holds us in the palm of its hand, that created every single thing on this planet, everything we think is good or bad, all of it, we're all connected. This dog, me and Ben, you and me, a tree, every single thing has the golden thread of this energy that we all came from and that we're going back to. Um, so allow yourself the gift to consider surrender. Look into it. Look at things that you're struggling with in your life. Look at old stories that you're, old stories that you're holding and release them. You don't have to hold them. You don't have to suffer through something. You can say, gosh, damn it, this is scary. It sucks. It hurts. But I'm going to jump in the flow for the learning. Give it to God and know that the best outcome for my highest good is coming. Um, so surrender, motherfuckers. Surrender. Um, and just quick ways to do that besides getting broken and on your knees and realizing you got nothing else to give. You don't have to get there. You can practice moving from your head to your heart, from your crazy ass brain to your true self, to your soul. This area is where every single answer that you need for your entire life exists. When we can quiet this and connect to this, this is the kingdom of God within, made in the likeness of God, that, that golden thread that connects us. It's all right here. You quiet this stuff, you connect to this, you're golden. Um, Go with the flow. Byron Katie has a great book called, I don't remember what it's called, but it talks about being at peace with what is. It might be called that, but it's everything that comes up going, all right, let's roll. Let's take, let's walk together hand in hand disease. Let's walk heartache. Let's walk. It's, it's the flow of life. Knowing the things that we call good and bad, they're equal. They're just for our learning. The good reinforces what we know, gives us a respite from learning. Um, lets us feel joy. And then the good stuff is what we call the bad stuff, the messy stuff. That's why I love the mess. That's where we get our nuggets. That's where we get our strength. That's why I have this podcast. And that's why I share about the mess. Someone once said to my good friend, Minda, they said, I'm not interested in that messy podcast because I don't want mess. I'm working to evolve. I'm working to overcome. I'm working to greatness. But like, oh, no, the greatness comes from the mess. We're here to be human. We're here to be messy. We're here to get dirty. And then we're here to wash our hands and to stand up and share what we learned with other people. So embrace your mess. I was going to say fight the power, but don't just embrace your mess. Enjoy the obstacles, surrender to them, flow with them, be at peace with what is and all that good stuff. Because although it sounds woo woo, it is good shit. And it has changed my life and it has t transformed the lives of the people around me because they get to become something new when I get the damn lessons they're here to teach me. Sorry, Charlie, it took me 13 years. And you're welcome, Eve, that I got a lot quicker. Um, but I'm just going to do a little blessing because it's just me. And I don't normally do this with a guest as well, but I like it. I'm going to do a little prayer. Um, God, I'm so grateful for this podcast. I'm so grateful how it came to be. I'm grateful for Ben, who I adore, who's here helping me. And I'm grateful for every single person that tunes in to listen, because I know that as I share my mess, there are people out there who feel alone in theirs and know that they're not alone. I put um, showering love and light on everyone who's watching, that you may know your worth, that you may stand up in your mess, that you may be gentle with yourself as you navigate the obstacles but that you may come out the other end enlightened, more powerful, more beautiful, and more in service to sharing what you've learned. Thank you for this time on the planet and let me continue to use it wisely. Amen. Amen, guys. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm happy you are here. I will see you um, on the next podcast. Subscribe, share this, please. And um, share it with your friends to su subscribe as well, because I'm sure one thing we talk on will touch their mess. All right, peace.